I just have a few items um, to share. It won't be a full report. We're going to uh, do that hopefully uh, at our AGM in November. So just a few uh, items. Um, the one, the first one, and we're excited about that and we hope it's going to work, is a May plant sale. We've missed it. We really look forward to, if all goes well, have it this coming spring. And in order for it to be a success, we need plants. So we ask that now, if you're still in your gardens, that you pot up plants, trees, perennials, anything that we can sell in May at the sale. There may also be a yard sale component. Likely we cannot have our uh, March it on out. So save your treasures as well for uh, May. And we were excited to hear that the students under uh, Ann Jackson's um, teaching will likely be able to provide veggies for the plant sale. So that's good news and we're hoping that that'll uh, pan out and uh, just encouraging everybody to uh, get some things together and we'll have a good sale in the spring. The other exciting event is the AGM. Well, generally AGMs are all that exciting, but <laughs> we hope to be able to meet in person. And uh, we hope to meet in person. We've got a hall booked. It's uh, November the 15th. You will be getting more details. Adhering to protocol, we will ask people to pre-register and there will be um, requests that you show proof of double vaccination. We need numbers. Um, there's going to be a workshop. I think Louise has again volunteered to lead a workshop. Arrangements, fall arrangements, not fall, probably more winter, uh, Christmassy. And uh, we'll need to know how many people are coming. And the other point is that our year's end is October 31st. We need to know for our reports, how many hours of volunteer work were done by our society members. So please tabulate your hours and Carol Van D is willing to uh, tabulate. So let Carol know how many hours you have spent this year working for and with the uh, Horticulture Society. That's short and sweet, that's it. Great, okay. So I'm gonna try and see if this is gonna work. So one of our things that we did was um, we held our sunflower show, our virtual sunflower show and people sent in uh, their photos and poems. So uh, we're gonna try and vote tonight. So I'm, this is my experiment. So hopefully you've had a chance to go on the website and see the entries and each entry had a number and you can vote for your favorite one. So categories one, two, and three, those we won't vote on because that was like the tallest sunflower and the biggest sunflower. So I'm, I'm gonna launch the poll right now. So you should see it pop up. You can go ahead and vote. And I have a little slideshow of the entries. Also, I'm gonna leave the poll open for the whole meeting so you can, you can have a look and still vote. Also at the end, we'll hang around and wait till everyone's had a chance to vote. So let me see if I can share my screen now. And here we go. Have a little slideshow. Hopefully, it works. Mm -hmm. 
The page for voting is right on top of the pictures in my screen. <laughs> you can move it if you control click on it and then you can drag it out of the way. So hopefully that wasn't too painful. <laughs> All right. It was good, Jacqueline. Really nice. Good. Nicely done. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. So um, I will turn it over to Louise now, who will introduce our special guest. Um, at one of our workshops, Christina uh, came along and um, was very um vocal about her passion <laughs> for for the monarch butterflies and it was so interesting to hear her talk about it that we decided we'd have a day trip over to her place to um to have more information on the monarchs and so there were about 15 of us and i thought this is such an important aspect of what we should be doing and what we, we should be uh, caring for apart from our garden, um, that I was uh, wanting to let everyone in our um, society know about it. So Christina is here to talk to us about the monarch butterfly this evening and what she's doing to save them all. <laughs> if only. Up to you, Christina. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. I'm just going to share my screen here and get started. Okay, so can everybody see my cover slide? Or can you see it? Just nod or something. I think everyone is, mute, is muted. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for having me to the meeting to talk about monarchs. They are absolutely my passion. My husband used to joke that he was always the top of my list in terms of my priorities. And then we had kids and he dropped down and then we got a dog and then he dropped down and then we got another dog and then we got cats and then came the caterpillars. So honestly, he's not below the caterpillars and he's not below the dogs and cats, but it's a standing joke here at my house because they're awfully important to me. So I wanted to share a little bit about myself. Who am I? I joined the Russell and District Horticultural Society back in 2020 during the pandemic. Um, I had been um, raising monarchs for quite a while at that point in time. And I wanted to understand more about um, 
how we could be more successful growing different species here on our property. We live um, just north of Williamsburg and just southeast of Winchester Springs. And we have about two acres here and it's a beautiful spot, which I swear I will never leave voluntarily. Um, but I wanted to learn more about different species that we could grow here and different techniques and processes and you know how to be more successful. I'm particularly interested in native plants and the importance of native plants. And you know, one thing that people say when they come is like, oh my gosh, something's eating this or that. And I have to be honest and say that I'm thrilled when something is eating our plants because it means that our plants and, and the biodiversity here is doing what it's supposed to do. The plants will survive in, in a balanced ecosystem where they're, um, you know, the insects and, and what eats them can, can eat them and then grow, but the plants can actually survive what is eating them as well because they have the natural um, ability to withstand a certain amount of destruction. Um, so um, that's a little bit about me. I'm a former software information developer. I once was a human resource advisor years and years and years ago in the public service, but I left, went back to school and became a high tech um, information developer uh, working in the software industry in Canada. Um, and everything changed in 2017 when I was struck by a driver who ran a red light and my hand was jammed into the steering wheel. And um, I ended up losing the function of my thumb. And so, you know, there's a great deal of pain involved with this, but I wasn't really able to do my job anymore. And a physiotherapist, a very wise physiotherapist that I was seeing said, you know, as you leave your job and start this new normal, you need to find something that will bring you joy because it's very easy to spiral down when you no longer have, you know, your career, which helped to define you and you no longer have your colleagues around you. And, you know, you live on this beautiful property, but it's isolated. And one thing I always enjoyed was walking. And so I started walking and walking and walking and walking. And eventually I was walking between 10 and 15 kilometers a day. And I started really looking at the nature that surrounded me and noticing the things that were there all along, but that I had never really stopped to see before. And some of the things that I saw, um, the little teeny tiny frog on the left, he looks large, but that's a milkweed plant. And he was no larger than the fingernail of my little finger. He was so, so tiny. And the second photograph is a moth that was on some milkweed here at home that I took inside my habitat just so that I could photograph him. And before I took him back outside and let him go, um, I did know the name once upon a time, I can find it and share it at some point if, if you'd like. It's not a native moth to our area, but it is absolutely regal with this cloak of feather-like hair. And um, the proboscis, which is the black and white, um, almost like a horn, I guess, um, is what it eats with. And those two antenna are like ram um, horns. They're absolutely beautiful. So and this is another fellow that I noticed. And then in the, the third photograph, we have a woodland cricket, a giant woodland cricket, who's very, very large. And in the fourth photograph, we have a um, praying mantis that I photographed on County Road 38, I believe, last summer. And frightened me a little bit because I wasn't expecting to see him. But he was there again, enjoying the milkweed and actually eating a caterpillar. Um, not happy sign, but I also saw this. And these are my absolute loves, um, a monarch butterfly larva. And we've all seen them black, white, and yellow. They're very, very distinctive. And I was fascinated by them. And I, once upon a time when I was a little girl, I knew someone that had had one in an aquarium to watch all of the different stages and I hadn't been able to follow it. But at the same time, a friend of mine said, oh, by the way, I have monarch caterpillars at my house and I've got a lot of them. And I called her up and I said, 
can I borrow one for a couple of weeks? Like, I promise I'll take good care of it. I'll like do everything that it needs and I'll, I'll make sure it has whatever it needs, but I'm stuck here at home and I don't have a lot to do. And I would absolutely love to be able to watch them. And my request for one turned into an request for two because I didn't want to take one away without it having someone else to hang out with. So as much as they are singular, I, uh, I brought two home and I set about watching them and I was absolutely blown away. They are fascinating. As caterpillars, they are, watching them do their thing was just enthralling for me. So between 2017 and 2020, I set about to learn everything I could about monarchs. I used my old research skills to delve into the world of monarch information, basically books, online resources, scientific studies, Facebook groups, all kinds of resources. Um, I joined the Beautiful Monarch Facebook group, which is made up of over 5,000 people who love monarchs as much as I do. And as I learned more and more, I had my own successes and my own failures. I learned from experience and I learned from the people that I encountered in the Beautiful Monarch Facebook group. I learned from other people um, and I started sharing what I was learning because, I mean, what good is it if you keep it all to yourself, right? But I was able to modify my processes also going forward so that I had greater success each year. So in 2017, I ended up, by the end of the summer, I had released 13 butterflies and I was thrilled. And in 2018, I released 27. In 2019, I released 39 butterflies. And in 2020, I went big and I released 154. And then came the law. And I don't mean literally, you know, no police came to my door, but monarch butterflies are a species of special concern in Ontario. Um, in the US and all across Canada as well, but of course we're governed here by Ontario legislation. And as a result, they're protected under the Ontario Endangered Species Act. What this means is that it's against the law to raise more than one monarch butterfly per person in Ontario, despite the fact that the ministry has absolutely no intention of charging anybody. And it seems really ironic to me because monarch eggs and larvae, chrysalids, and even the butterflies, they're safer in captivity at times than they are out in the wild. And it's a bit heartbreaking to me. Um, in the wild, only five out of every 100 monarch butterfly eggs make it to adult butterfly. That's like 5% and that's devastating. Um, the reasons for that, um, I mean, we're talking about the eggs, so the habitat loss doesn't really affect them at this point in time. But one of the things that's affecting monarchs terribly is um, habitat loss both here and in Mexico. So I'll talk about Mexico first and get it out of the way. Um, clear cutting, illegal clear cutting of the forest land where the migrating monarchs overwinter is being destroyed and reduced. And the government is not, has not been enacting any measures to help protect it. So the US and Canada and other countries um, are absolutely taking note but there's not a whole lot happening. There are a lot more bigger priorities in terms of the things that are affecting the world and you know, COVID and, and a lot of other measures that are way more important, I guess. But the reality is that it's happening and it's gonna continue to happen. Um, here at home, there's habitat loss as well. Um, you know, so many fields are being turned into housing developments and cropland. And there are good reasons for all of it, but it's being done without replacing the habitat that's been lost. And that doesn't affect just monarchs, that affects all pollinators. Um, particularly as far as the monarchs go, the lack of milkweed and the reduction in milkweed that's available um, in the wild has been drastically reduced. And climate change has, has more plays a role as well in terms of 
both the triggers that signal to monarchs when to migrate and also the life cycles of the plants upon which they nectar um, because all of those are affected by temperature changes and they like hours and all of that and all of that's been affected by climate change. In terms of the predators, um, for the caterpillars, we're talking spiders, wasps, skin buds, mantids, birds, and humans, and absolutely humans. Um, we're one of the worst predators because we cut the roadsides in many, many municipalities all year long. So the eggs are laid on the milkweed, what milkweed there is left, the caterpillars hatch and are growing, and then the plant gets cut down and all of their food source is, is dying and they are, you know, they lose out in the meantime. Caterpillars can only go so far to find another milkweed plant. Um, birds, the caterpillars won't be eaten by birds, but it doesn't mean that birds won't try. They will, you know, pick it up, you know, maybe chop it in half and then realize it doesn't taste good and spit it out, but there still goes a monarch caterpillar in the dust. Um, as far as humans, again, you know, we do things like spraying plants, um, and so there's, I mean, the damage that we do is pretty much at the top of the list, in my opinion. Um, and as for the butterflies, you know, birds will, some species of birds will uh, go after the monarch butterflies. Mantids are known to eat an entire butterfly. And humans as well, because as we drive down the highways, we often splatter them on our windshields and whatnot. So we lose a fair number um, of both the caterpillars and the butterflies that actually are, that hatch here and um, mature here. So I wanna talk about milkweed for a minute. Um, my husband is a former dairy farmer absolutely hates milkweed, grew up, you know, walking fields and pulling it out by the roots. And there's absolutely every reason in the world to keep it out of cropland. I support farmers 150% and I understand their need to eliminate milkweed from their crops. Um, it's toxic to all vertebrates in its raw form, I should say. And, you know, it's very, very toxic to dairy cattle and other um, livestock. I know, you know, it's not just enough that cows don't eat it in the fields if they're out in the pasture. If you bale up milkweed in a, ba in a bale of hay and feed it over the winter and the cow recognizes that there's milkweed in the hay, he'll very likely back away from it and refuse to eat that feed. And there goes the farmer's best effort to provide feed for his cattle for the winter. So. I support farmers and I have absolutely no problem with them eliminating milkweed from their cropland. What I do object to is the effort underway to eliminate milkweed from every other location, you know, around hydro poles on the roadsides, along roadsides, in fields that grow up in weeds. Milkweed is the only plant that the caterpillars can consume. It's, that's all there is. And the butterflies, for that very reason, lay their eggs on usually on the undersides of the milkweed leaves, so that when the caterpillar hatches, it, it comes out and it's directly on its food source. So the more that we eliminate milkweed, we're eliminating the opportunity to keep monarchs here. It's taken them eons to evolve to the point where they have one specialized host and you know, people say, well, you know, they must be able to eat something else. Well, it's going to take eons for them to find that something else. And we don't really have eons. And so, I mean, I've stated it a bunch of times, but we are eliminating milkweed at an alarming rate. As a sidebar, um, David Suzuki Foundation engages everyday residents like me to advocate for pollinators and to inspire the creation of new pollinator habitats right across the country. I know that Cindy Saucier, a member of our UHS, is um, a leader, a butterfly wave project leader for Russell. And I'm a leader for the county of Stormont, Dundas, and Glenberry, along with a woman by the name of Carol Fidler. And we've had some amazing successes here. Um, we've 
had some great partnerships with South Asian Conservation, Raisin River Conservation, um, Stormont Gun Gas and Glen Gary Transportation and Planning Department, who's helping us find ways to protect some of the pollinator habitats that exist along roadways. The Township of North Dundas has been amazingly supportive and helpful, as it has been the Township of South Glengarry. And we have some really exciting new initiatives coming in 2022 with some of these partnerships. And the reason I raise this now is because it's projects like this that help create the pollinator habitats that we've lost through spraying, through cutting, through urbanization, through um, clear cutting and other means. One of the problems that the pollinators face right across the board, this isn't specific to monarchs, is that the space between their habitats has become so distant that it's not a normal pathway for them anymore to travel their previous migration paths. So what the David Suzuki Foundation is doing is literally getting each of us to inspire people to create these new habitats and then creating a national map of all of the new pathways and habitats that have been created each year. And this year alone, we created 4,500 new habitats across the country from the Butterfly Way ambassadors. So that's pretty exciting. And I'm really happy to be a part of that. So back to monarchs for a moment. In 2017, I had a little globe aquarium for my two, originally two, and then more caterpillars. In 2018, I graduated to a square aquarium, both of which were housed in my kitchen on our counter because I was just watching them all the time. And in 2019, my husband said, could they please go outside? And so he worked with me. I purchased a, a china cabinet on Kijiji from a woman who was so happy that I was going to have a place to display my china. And I never admitted to her that my intent was to bring it home and to take it all apart, take out the glass, put in screen, and create a habitat for the monarch larva and, and butterflies. And um, it worked really well. The caterpillars were down in the bottom and I had fresh milkweed every day. You can see some floral tubes and some stands there. And I literally would swap in fresh milkweed every day. The caterpillars would migrate to the fresh stuff when they were done with the milkweed that they were on. And as they were ready to pupate, they would climb up to the very top and find a nice spot and spin their silk button and form a chrysalis. And that worked out really, really well. Um, one of the things that I didn't know the first two years that I was raising monarchs was the importance of raising them outside. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but in 2019, I absolutely started raising them outside in as natural a habitat as I could. And in 2021, I, really, I guess I used that, um, that China cabinet for two years, but in 2021, my family built me a beautiful outdoor monarch habitat. It's large enough that children and adults can come in and sit and watch and enjoy and take pictures and just be mesmerized the way I am. Because of the law, I pursued and was granted a permit under the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Wildlife to raise monarch butterflies in my natural outdoor habitat. And part of this permit requires me to submit data at the end of each season, which I happily do. Um, the data is then rolled up and, and helps to um, formulate some of the, um, the information that's published about the monarch population in Ontario. I collected eggs and caterpillars this past summer from June through August and I released my very last one two days ago. He was such a straggler. It was a little girl actually. And um, so this year I successfully, successfully released 270 and each one was as beautiful as the last. So what is so fascinating about monarchs? Well, they're one of the very few insects that have an annual migration, much like birds do. 
The butterflies that leave here in the fall fly up to 4,800 kilometers to their winter destination. And as anyone who's ever watched a butterfly knows, that 4,800 kilometers is probably 9,000 kilometers because they don't fly in a straight line. They dipsy doodle all over the place. So that's amazing to me. And they've been um, tracked as flying as much as 300 miles in one day, which again, oh my goodness. There are migrators and non-migrators among the monarchs that we have here. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Scientific studies have shown that monarchs retain memory, not just in their adult butterfly form, but also from caterpillar to butterfly. And I have experienced this myself. Their navigation system resides in their antenna, not in their brain. I think that that's really, really interesting. When the butterflies migrate south in the fall, they know to fly with the morning sun on their left. Conversely, when butterflies migrate north in the spring, they know to fly with the morning sun on their right. This was a scientific study that involved putting butterflies in drums and turning them like in pitch black and, and removing all nature of any type of, um, of touch point for them. And wherever the light was, whenever they released them from these drums, they always flew with the light on their left. Um, so I, again, I think that's absolutely fascinating. In two short weeks, the caterpillar grow, caterpillars grow from like two millimeters to two and a half centimeters. They like, I don't even know how many, it's obviously that's like a lot. I didn't do the math and math is not my strong point, but to see them be absolutely so tiny and vulnerable and then to like have them progress and grow to be the adults that then form the chrysalis. It's just amazing. So why do I love monarchs? They are hands down the gentlest creatures that I have ever encountered. They are shy, they're timid. They, um, they don't like change. They just want to eat milkweed and poop. Honestly, that's all they do. They poop all day long and they eat all day long. They're not morning people. They only really get going around 10 or 11 o'clock every day. But they are, you know, you take one on your hand and you can feel their legs, the suctions of their legs very gently holding you as they walk along. And, you know, both the caterpillars and the butterflies, they cause harm to nobody um, and they are so vulnerable. They, are, they have no defenses whatsoever. So I love them because they need taken care of, I guess. Their life cycle is incredible and their transformation at each stage is mesmerizing. The caterpillars are fun to watch. They're, they're entertaining. You know, sometimes they fight over a milkweed leaf or, um, you know, one doesn't like the taste of something and they, they kind of will shake their heads back and forth and, and um, let you know that they don't like what they're tasting. Um, the caterpillars, I, I can watch them all day, and I do. The butterflies are so beautiful. Um, there's nothing like the wings. And on their wings, the wings are colored with scales. They're like little teeny tiny dust scales and the scales come off. If you see a monarch, an old monarch with battered wings that are no longer colorful, it's simply that the wing has lost the scales that provide the beautiful colors. Um, and in our part of the world, we're at risk of losing them. Scientists estimate that by the year 2060, we may not have our migrating monarchs any longer. So let's talk about the monarch life cycle. I mentioned that they go south to Mexico in the fall. So let's look at December, January, and February. They're overwintering in Mexico. They're not eating a lot. They're kind of in a hibernation phase. They hang out in the forest down there in the trees. And in March, they start to wake up and come alive again. And, and they fully mature during this time. So these butterflies, I'm going to call them our grandparents. They 
leave Mexico and with the sun on their right, they start the journey back north again. And they don't make it all the way back here. A lot of people say, oh yeah, the ones that leave are the ones that return in the spring. No, they don't. The ones that they do start back here and they likely make it as far as somewhere in the Southern states like Atlanta, Georgia, or like somewhere down in there. And the East Coast for sure. Um, by the time they land in whatever destination, um, as far as they go, they are fully mature, they mate, the females lay eggs, and they only live about six weeks. So from the time that they left Mexico, when they become fully mature and begin to mate, their life span is six weeks. At that point, the second generation, our parents' generation, hatches as caterpillars somewhere down in the southern U.S. And the caterpillars become the butterflies that are our parents, and they fly usually north here and make it back up here. And that can be anywhere between the first week of June and the first week of July. Two years ago, they didn't arrive back here until the first week of July. We had a really wet, cold spring and everything delayed. Last, this past summer, they got here the first week of June and I wasn't ready. I wasn't expecting them until later, but they arrived back. The first ones were here, they were laying eggs. So the parent generation born from the Mexico generation of our grandparents. When those butterflies eclose from the chrysalis, they are fully mature adults. They mate, the females lay eggs, and they live about six weeks, maybe seven. So the second generation, our parents' generation is very short-lived. The third generation, our generation, is exactly the same as our parents. The second generation, our parents, they lay eggs, they mate, they lay eggs, they live six to eight weeks. We hatch, we spend about two weeks maturing as caterpillar larvae, and we form the chrysalis when we emerge as butterflies. We are fully mature as well when we come out of the chrysalis. And we mate, and we lay eggs, and then we only live about six to eight weeks. We, like female butterflies, have been documented as laying as many as 500 eggs a day. So they have a job to do and they get right at it. The interesting thing is what happens as we move into August and as our generation begins to mate and lay eggs. We start moving into fall and with fall comes shorter daylight hours. So whereas we might have had 13 to 14 daylight hours prior to um, like back in June and July, the daylight hours are now shortened and that evokes a change in the caterpillars. So does the temperature difference. And I mean the difference between the overnight temperature and the daytime temperature. That difference is larger. And as a result, that also triggers a change in the caterpillars. And the third thing that happens is that the quality of milkweed that they eat is much reduced. Um, you know, it's dying along the roadsides, it's starting to turn yellow, and that impacts the caterpillars as well. And so what happens is when these caterpillars, our children, so to speak, are in the fifth instar, which is the largest stage the caterpillar reaches before it forms the chrysalis, those three factors cause a physiological change in the caterpillar so that when it pupates and forms the chrysalis, when the butterfly emerges, it's not a fully mature butterfly. The butterfly is like a teenager with, well, maybe not a teenager, let's say a 10 year old with no desire whatsoever to reproduce. The only instinct that that butterfly has is to fly south. And that's what they do. And by virtue of not being mature, they're in a state that's called reproductive diapause. They live up to eight months. They fly south to Mexico, the ones that make it over winter there. And then in the spring, 
rinse and repeat, the cycle starts again and we start to journey back. So the fact that what always humbles me is that the second generation, our parents, and the third generation, us, their sole existence is to create that fourth generation to migrate back to Mexico. Because without the fourth generation being migrators and having those changes that caused by the changing environment here, um, we would not have monarchs at all here. But they come back, we have the two generations that perpetuate the species here, and then the fourth generation returns to Mexico. I, that just blows my mind. Um, and the thing I, I just want to point out here as well is that that second and third generation, that's where the roadside cutting and spraying is happening. So every time that we cut roadsides and reduce the numbers of eggs that can have the opportunity to reach fully mature butterflies, we're reducing the potential population that will return to Mexico in the fall. And just a personal anecdote here. I, um, I live on a road in South Dundas that is cut three times a year. It's cut at the end of May, um, a four foot cut. It's cut um, the last week of July or the first week of August. It's a 10 foot cut. And it's not just a cut. If they cut it and then the, the um, grass and weeds are brought into like a, a machine that mulches them and skews them back out onto the down to the side of the road. And then again, in late September, we have another four foot roadside cut. But the day that the cut was happening on my road, I followed the um, machine down the road. I let him get up far enough ahead of me that he knew I wasn't gonna attack him or anything. And so walking down the road behind, I knew where the four milkweed plants were on my road, on my side of the road. And I found them all. And from the cuttings that had been cut up and skewed out, I got three eggs and two caterpillars. And I brought them all home. Um, like who knows how many I didn't find, but you know, if just on my little stretch of a half a kilometer road, there were five that were impacted by the roadside cut, there are a lot that are getting impacted all across Eastern Ontario that potentially don't have to be. So that's my passion. So I'm gonna give you my photo album of the Monarch Life Cycle. So on the left is me holding a milkweed leaf back in June. And you can see that it's kind of shaped like a football and it has a little white tip. And so that is the size of an egg, it's minuscule. Once you know what to look for, it's super easy to find. And on the right, the photograph shows the eggs that I've brought home. And what I do, I take a single hole punch with me and I punch out the egg on the leaf. I turn the punch upside down and just push it over the egg onto, um, like I center the egg in the punch and I just punch it out and take it off with tweezers and stick it in a little box and bring it home. Um, the reason I do that is because there's no reason to kill a whole leaf or to, um, cause stress to the plant when all I really want is this little teeny tiny circle. Um, most of the tips are white, as you can see, but the, the very top row, the second from the right, the tip is black. And the reason for that is because there's a little tiny amount of caterpillar that's coming out to be hatching. And monarch caterpillars are known for their black eggs. So on the left again is the size of a monarch caterpillar when it comes out of the egg absolutely minuscule. And on the right is about a three day old monarch caterpillar that now has its colors and stripes and no longer has the big black ball head that you saw previously. So this kind of looks like a prehistoric creature and it's not, it's a monarch caterpillar. They need to molt. When they grow so quickly, and their size changes so much over such a short time, the only way that they can do that is by losing the cuticle that is their outer skin. So they have to molt literally four times. Um, 
they lose their skin again a fifth time when they pupate. But when they go from first instar to second instar, second instar to third instar, each one of those changes involves a molt so that they can have the space necessary to continue to grow inside their skin. Um, what happens is the caterpillar will leave the plant usually and find a nice quiet place, lay a silk mat, spin a silk mat from its spinneret and literally crawl onto it. And then over the next 24 to 48 hours, the body of the caterpillar reabsorbs a lot of the enzymes and nutrients of the skin into its body. And all that's left is this very thin rubbery um, outer shell almost. It's not really a shell, it's, it's, you can stretch it. It's very, very rubbery. And then when the caterpillar is ready and the skin has been totally loosened, it does like a shimmy and shake and it takes about a half an hour to walk out of its skin. And the reason it can do that is because the skin is stuck, stuck to the silk mat. And then very often the caterpillar will turn and eat the skin. It contains a lot of good nutrients and protein. And also I imagine it's so that predators don't know where the caterpillar was. Um, you'll, you'll notice that the feet, the legs, um, and the true legs, the three pairs of true legs at the front and the face are all yellow. That's natural. Um, after about a half an hour to 45 minutes, the caterpillar, the, the legs will turn black slowly and gradually and the stripes return, the black stripes return to the face. So it's almost like the new skin is reabsorbing what it needs to have the telltale monarch coloring. So here are some more pictures of my lovely caterpillars. On the left is in my habitat this year, and on the right is last summer. Um, I had a photographer come and take some lovely pictures, and her pictures were actually featured in um, a local SDNG magazine. Um, I can't recall the name, but Louise will remember it because it was the magazine was taken to the workshop that we did and was shared. I'll come up with the name shortly, but there was a profile done on the need to, to support monarchs in SDNG and this wonderful photographer named Stephanie Hildebrand took some lovely photographs. So this is the stage. Most of them are at the stage where they're ready to pupate. And when they're ready to pupate, what I have on the left is a close-up picture of a caterpillar spinning a silk button. And the three pairs of true legs at the front are like flippers, and they work just like hands. It's amazing. The third pair of true legs that you see right where the button is in the circle pretty much anchor the caterpillar to the point where it is creating the silk button. And it's what it does is it, it brings the silk out of the spinneret and it forms the mound. It gets to a certain height and then it will lay a silk over the mound in a bicycle wheel spoke pattern. It'll do like four or five spokes in front, like to the right that we're seeing right now of this silk button and then it will back up and do the same bicycle spokes um, on the other side and then it will rinse and repeat do more of the same the first time i witnessed this close up i had a magnifying glass and i was sitting in my butterfly habitat and the caterpillar that i watched imagine you have a mouthful of bubble gum this caterpillar was using the two true legs at the front to pull silk like bubble gum out of its mouth and then it was using those two front true legs to wad it into a little ball with both hands going left and right and then it pushed that that wad of silk up against the top and pushed it up until it held and then it went over it in that wheel spoke pattern to secure it to the top and then it did it again and the fact that i was watching this caterpillar use those legs just like hands to create this wad of silk was just amazing to me so i've been bound and determined that i'm going to capture that particular method again 
I haven't been able to yet, but I'm not going to stop trying. It was just, I mean, there's many, many different ways that individual caterpillars will form that silk button, but um, watching them do it, it takes them about three and a half hours. It's, it must be exhausting for them, but um, it's really quite something to see. On the right hand side, you see a chrysalis hanging from the cremaster, which is that black stem that you see. And on the right is a caterpillar who just recently turned around and planted its two clasper legs and its anal mound at the back over the top of the silk button. And I'll tell you, they spend about 45 minutes with those two clasper legs and the anal mound just molding it into the perfect form to fit in that little triangle of space. And once they're satisfied that it's the perfect shape, um, and that they're stuck to it, they will then, I mean, the caterpillar is horizontal all this time. And I have videos as well of the caterpillar, like walking over the silk button and finding it with those back legs, just by feel, figuring out where it is and then, you know, planting itself and attaching itself to it. The caterpillar will release its head and the front two legs and then the, the, the mid range legs and it'll hang in a, in a tight J like we're seeing here. And between, oh, it depends on things like if it's cold or not, or if it's extremely hot, it can be anywhere between like 12 hours to 36 hours. The caterpillar will stretch out completely and um, it's no longer a J, it's more like a really bad downspout shape. And, um, the antenna will twist into curly cues. They don't have any form to them any longer. And then the caterpillar will start its um, pupation, pupation. It'll start to pupate. And the difference between butterflies and moths is moths use their silk to spin around themselves. And then they're housed within the silk cocoon. Butterflies shed their skin and underneath is the chrysalis. So this is my favorite photograph of all time. It shows kind of everything in action. Um, the butterfly in front has just eclosed about 40 minutes ago from the chrysalis. You can see that the membrane of the chrysalis is transparent. Um, and this butterfly is a male. I'll talk about that again in a minute. On the very far left is a caterpillar who has begun to pupate. You can kind of see that the antennas are twisted and you can see how the skin has split and the chrysalis is starting to emerge. Um, there are three green chrysalids behind the butterfly that are recent. And on the far right, you can see a chrysalis. A butterfly will come out of that chrysalis probably in about two days. You can begin to see the, the shape of the wing and the colors of the wing, the black lines through the through the cuticle of the chrysalis. And people say, I don't understand how a chrysalis turns from green to black and you can see the butterfly through it. And it doesn't. The chrysalis is always transparent, but um, monarch caterpillars are made of milkweed. And so they're green, they're, they're just all green. And so what you're seeing is the green of the insides of the caterpillar essentially. And then as the butterfly matures and starts to come out, you begin to actually just literally see the butterfly through the, through the chrysalis. So the difference between male and female, I said I would come back to this, is the males have a round or oval spot on the third line of their lower wings um, out from their abdomens, and the females do not. So it's really easy to tell a male from a female when you're used to handling them. And sometimes you can see the spot from the underside of the wing, but not very often. Um, usually it's only visible if the butterfly opens its wings, like this, like this, this one crown. So I have some videos to share. Um, I've tested them a whole bunch of times, so I hope that they work well. This is the fun part. I'll get to where they show. 
and there's no sound for them so that I can keep talking. So this is a little tiny monarch caterpillar. I, I apologize that it's not clearer than it is. I've got a new camera for next year. So that should look much better. But first, the caterpillar chews a hole in the egg and squeezes his way out and takes a little bit of, of uh, work to get out. And this particular caterpillar, once it does get out, it goes for a little walkabout and then comes back. They eat their eggs. And again, the reason that they do so is very much like the caterpillars eating their skins when they molt. Um, it contains nutrients and proteins that will help it um, become uh, like a healthy caterpillar. So caterpillars at this age are unbelievably vulnerable um, to so many things. Um, you know, extreme temperatures, um, if the plant that it's on, like ants, um, you know, when I, when I look at a plant and it's covered in ants, I know there will be no eggs and or caterpillars on it because ants devour them as do all kinds of beetles, um, you name it. But there you can see the caterpillar is like munching away on his egg. And um, it's such an instinct for them. And, and the, dis, the, the discernible blackhead is what always makes um, the monarch. So this is the fascinating part, um, watching a caterpillar pupate. And I've gotten really good now. I can tell you exactly when it's going to happen. So you can see that the antenna no longer have any shape or form. They're all twisted and curly cued. The caterpillar was hanging very much in a vertical shape. And you can see that the two legs at the top are and the anal opening there they're just really clasping that silk button and it's inching its way out of the skin the skin only splits so far and then it's a question of i think if you think of how the caterpillar used to walk it moves its back legs forward first and then all of the other legs move forward and it's very much the same muscle motion that's happening here. It takes them about a minute and a half. If you blink, sometimes you miss it. Um, when the skin is all at the very top, the pupa, it's now longer a caterpillar, the pupa will do what I call a hula hoop dance. It, it spins around and it looks like um, it's kind of going crazy, but what it's doing is number one, it's trying to loosen that skin to drop off. And it's also working to secure the cremaster, the black stem into the silk button. And if you think of the cremaster, it's, it has, if you think of the top as being like Velcro, it has thousands of minuscule loops at the top of the cremaster. And so what it does is it drills that cremaster up into the silk button to secure the chrysalis so that you know wind and rain and being bumped and knocked will not knock it down. So he's starting to SAT issue. I could watch this every day, all day. I do in the summertime. So now he's starting that hula hoop dance of wriggling and arching in all directions. So the line that you see, there's a white line across about the middle. That line is the gold line that you see toward the top of the other chrysalis. So Right now, the bulk of the mass of the pupa is at the bottom. And all of those, they look kind of like rungs, rings. The inside the pupa, it will continue to shift and shake and adjust itself until the bulk is at the top of the chrysalis. 
and that takes about an hour and a half, two hours or so for it to get to the point of um, being the, like the normal shape of a chrysalis. So you might be wondering why there are one, two, three, four, five, six in this little corner of um, the wall in my butterfly habitat. The reason is I mentioned previously that monarch caterpillars are incredibly timid and they will um, follow, they will always follow um, a caterpillar who went before. So anytime, I'm going to just pause this for a second so that I can continue talking. Okay. So anytime that a caterpillar is ready to go and molt or is ready to go and form um, its chrysalis and it needs to leave the plant, they're very insecure. It will find the silk laid by a caterpillar who went before. And assuming that it's a safe one, um, they will follow it. And so very often you end up with like a whole bunch clustered in a corner because that caterpillar happened to find that the path that the one and two and three and four and five laid before it. So here I have a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis. I have to warn you, it ends very rapidly at the end. So don't be shocked by the, like, you know, if you're watching closely and all of a sudden it, the screen changes to a YouTube advertisement. But so you can see how the chrysalis is transparent. You can see the butterfly wings inside and you can see how the chrysalis has split in essentially like one very large and one small piece along the two seams on the back side. So the head is down and the legs are all folded up inside and the wings are tiny. And I don't know if you noticed the size of the abdomen on some of the pictures that I showed previously but monarchs have a very thin abdomen. When they come out of the chrysalis, their abdomens are huge. And the reason is, is they are filled with fluid. And that fluid, they then, once they emerge, they pump into their wings to fill them up. And then once full, they take about an hour or so to dry and to become the stiff wings that we're familiar with. So if you see kind of like under the chin, there are little elbow type things like this that are, that are um, tap, tap, tapping. And you're going to see a curly cue. Looks like an antenna, but it's in a curly cue right there. That curly cue is the proboscis. That's what the butterfly uses to um, nectar at plants to absorb the nectar. And when it comes out of the chrysalis, it's in two parts. And those two labial palps that are kind of like elbows to me, they tap them closed. The left side of, of the proboscis is like a C and the right side is like a C. And those two labial palps push them together and make a straw. And at the end of that is a sponge. So essentially monarch butterflies don't drink, they absorb the nectar from flowers. And the reason they're so successful is because it's very, very long. <clears throat> um, so you can already see that the wings are starting to fill from the time that it came out of the chrysalis. And um, it takes about a half an hour until it reaches the stage of the one behind. You can see how it's tapping the proboscis together. So this is a beautiful picture of my butterfly habitat, a small video. I wanted to share it because when a lovely group from the Russell Horticultural, <coughs> um, Russell District Horticultural Society came to visit me, they did a collection and left me with a hat full of coins. And I felt somewhat guilty about that because I don't really have many expenses and I, 
don't want people to feel that it costs something to come. I want everyone to feel that they can come and hang out with my caterpillars and butterflies. Um, but what I did do is I went to a beautiful nursery in Russell called um, Beyond the House. And I bought all of those flowers that you see. And I brought them back. I mean, I'd had some flowers before, but I changed them up every little while and give the butterflies fresh flowers to nectar at so that, you know, if it's a rainy day and I don't really want to release them, then you know, they can eat and be happy inside. But it's a beautiful day that day. So all of those butterflies were actually released that day. Which made everybody happy. And then this is the last video I wanted to share because the act of releasing a butterfly is lovely. And I try and let everyone who comes to visit do so, whether it's a child or an adult, they are very content to be on your hand um, until they've been out flying in nature and then they don't really want to have anything to do with us anymore. I guess they're like, you know, kids. <laughs> anyway, um, this one, the very fast fluttering that you see is the butterfly, you know, testing its wings and getting ready to fly and like working with its muscles to see exactly how it's going to go. And then it goes. And some go quickly and some take a while. Some hang around for a few days before they go off. But um, I enjoy every single one and the release of each one is super special. And sometimes the caterpillars leave me love notes. Thank you very much for letting me share my passion with you. And I'm, I'm eager to answer any questions that I can. I don't have all the answers, but I certainly like to try. Okay. Come and see me next year, like truly. I it's sure will. I love butterflies as well. <laughs> It's almost like um, like a Zen experience when you're sitting with them and everything is so quiet and they surround you and they're just doing what they need to do. It's magical. I'm so lucky I get to do it, you know. And so I and actually it's growing um, a church group in Winchester that has a community garden for the local food share program has decided to add a pollinator garden. And they had a small shed that they were going to get rid of. And I suggested they turn it into a butterfly habitat. And they're doing so. They're going to get a permit as well for next summer. And they're going to have this community butterfly habitat that they'll be able to use to educate people and, and you know, have Sunday school outings just in their, in their yard. So it's really exciting. The number of people who are getting enthusiastic is really overwhelming. Um, I have a question. Yes. I was surprised to hear you say that they can come back as early as the beginning of June. Is the milkweed even ready at that time? Uh, some are, and you'd be surprised. I grew milkweed in pots myself this year because, you know, going out every day on the roads and finding scarce milkweed is, is something that takes up a lot of time. And I thought if I had pots of different aged milkweed growing, then I could cycle the pots through my habitat and just migrate new pots in. And so when pots, when I cut pots, the milkweed off after the um, caterpillars had raised it, and I, I would cut them off at the, at the earth level and put the pots back outside, it starts growing again right away and within days I had little shoots and I had wow. butterflies laying eggs on little tiny shoots. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So as long as they're growing um and they're up, you know, two or three inches, the butterflies will lay eggs on them. Super. Uh the other question, uh, not everybody wants milkweed in their flower beds. What about the butterfly weed, the orange asclepsis? Is it as good for the butterflies, for the monarchs? It is, actually. Um, I prefer common myself here. I mean, I have some butterfly weed as well. And also, we have swamp milkweed, 
here oh. in different places. It's it's got a red flower. It's really pretty too. Mm -hmm. um, so I prefer to go common just because it's what is native to this right. area, and I think you know that's what they're used to. So I'll but I I also grew the orange beautiful orange flowered it butterfly leaf, and um, they like that as well. Okay. I was a little more hesitant just because I wasn't um, like, I didn't want to leave it. I didn't want to put caterpillars on it and make them think that they're what they were used to was no longer available to them, but some did naturally migrate to it and they liked it very much. Okay. Good to know. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I know your point about growing milkweed and I'm, like I said, my farm, my husband's a former dairy farmer and I have a raised garden bed beside our house that is bricked on one side and so the likelihood of the milkweed growing outside of it right away is unlikely okay. i transplanted some milkweed plants three years ago from my farmer's field we're surrounded by dairy farms and mm -hmm. they've all given me permission to go into their fields and <laughs> transplant the milkweed they're pretty happy to see me do it um, but it took two years this is the first year that I actually had plants growing and but they didn't flower so oh. my my um, deal with all of our neighbors is that i will never let it go to seed so that they don't have to worry about the seeds infiltrating their crops mm -hmm. and the other thing is that i say to people is that when you pull a plant out by the root you disrupt the lateral root pattern and you know granted you plant one or two plants and you're going to probably have 15 yes. but pull the ones you don't want and the rest will be fine and you know the longer that you continue to do that um if you're willing to do that i mean i am because i like seeing them in my garden and um my neighbors are all watching you know where i'm growing it and I I have hundreds of seeds and thousands of seeds. If anybody needs milkweed that you're interested in planting somewhere, you just have to let me know. Super. Thank you. You're welcome. The permit that you got, did that yes. just uh, was that just for raising the uh, caterpillars and butterflies, or or was it also to include uh, you breeding, having your butterflies breed? Not breeding, not at all. Okay. So it's very it can be very difficult to acquire a permit. Um, there are a lot of different conservation organizations offer training in raising monarchs and then will issue the permit when you complete the training and the training can take two months because they want you to experience all of the different stages of handling and all of the practices that um, you actually need to learn to do it successfully and safely for the butterflies. Um, I didn't know for the first two years that I shouldn't have been doing it. And I had a 95% success rate. So I kind of dare anyone to be critical, but I wasn't doing it in accordance with um, the legislation. And so when I, it appeared like I was gonna lose a whole season to training to learn what I already knew. Um, someone told me about the Toronto Entomologist Association. So the Toronto Entomology Association is a phenomenal organization out of Toronto of entomologists, scientists, people who love butterflies and moths. And they issue newsletters that are beautiful and informative and amazing. And they also have a permit that they can extend to individuals. And so when I learned about them, I contacted the individual who um, runs the program. And I can share this information if you, I provided my email address in some of the information that I've, that I've um, offered after tonight. And just email me and I'll share the information with you. They have about 300 people now, I think, in Ontario that they have extended their permit. It allows 100 butterflies per individual living at the address. And so 
my husband and I together, we were allowed 200. And then my daughter came home for the month of August and I added her, which allowed me to go up to 270. Um, but they want you to do it safely. And, mm -hmm. and I, I have to say, um, there's a parasite that is impacting monarchs in a really bad way. And one of, I didn't really go into a lot of detail here, but I, I test about 50% of my monarchs for the parasite. And that involves um, like, like holding a piece of scotch tape to the abdomen and then putting that piece of scotch tape under onto a slide and viewing it under a handheld microscope and seeing and looking for the presence of the spores. And if the butterfly is madly infested, um, you're supposed to euthanize them because they cause deformities in, in um, the like the eggs that a female lays will be infected and it'll lessen the health of the population at large. So, um, so a lot of, I do that as well. Um, and I actually had an infestation the very last week of August that was devastating to me. I lost about 11 butterflies. They, they emerged from the chrysalis completely deformed and unable to survive. And you know, I was forced to euthanize them all and it was absolutely devastating. But on the plus side, I've also performed a wing transplant and successfully on a butterfly. And one that had damaged its wing, what would have been unable to survive actually was released and did survive. So you know, that's a balance. Any other questions? Can I, this might sound silly, but um, I wonder the same thing about geese. Why don't they just stay in Mexico? What compels <laughs> them to come up here? <laughs> it's something in their DNA. It, it's just their DNA. I, I, there's no explanation. Like the scientists have been studying it for years. They know what the triggers are. They know what, what makes a migrator and what makes a non-migrator. Um, they just have this instinct and urge to fly. And I, I mean, it's probably the weather. They seek warmer weather. I don't know how they know to all arrive at the overwintering destination. I don't know if you've seen the videos, but there are like hundreds of thousands of monarchs and all like fluttering around in the air. And it's just amazing. Um, hmm. I don't know what makes them go there. I'm awfully glad they do. I'm awfully glad they come back at this point in time. The, we're, we're fortunate. Our monarch situation is not as dire as the West Coast. Um, there are butterflies that, that migrate from BC and the West Coast of Canada all the way down also to Texas and into Mexico. And their numbers are down by 95%. And I've seen reports already from the summer that say that the population that has been migrating is nowhere near what they had hoped it would be. So it's just dire all around. We had a couple of comments and um, like a question in the uh, chat. So uh, Karen was asking about a uh, bog marsh um, milkweed. So like, uh, so I think you sort of spoke about that already. But she was yeah. asking because in, where she she has a new home and where where it is, it's, there's kind of a lot of bog and marsh around. So she was looking for a type of milkweed that would do well there. Yeah. So swamp milkweed grows very well in wet spots um, on a side road adjacent. Well, our, our house is on a corner and the road that runs east and west goes over a little creek and all along the sides of the creek, um, swamp milkweed, the red milkweed is growing. I use the, um, um, there's the name of the app that I use to identify plants. Um, picture this, it's called. And, you know, I took pictures of it and identified it. And then it was this beautiful red swamp milkweed. And um, I know that it will transplant well, provided you can keep it in a wet environment, but it should do really well in the type of um, environment that you described.
uh, somebody else was also mentioning they would they wanted to contact you. So I just wanted to say that you had given us a handout, which I posted on our website. So people can go there and see that, but I'll also email it out to everyone on the list. Thank you. And truly, um, my greatest joy is when little kids come with their parents and I have all these like little size kids stools and we sit inside the habitat and when they experience a caterpillar walking across their hand, it's just enthralling for them. And, you know, I put a caterpillar um, or a butterfly on their hand and we walk out of the habitat together and sometimes it stays for a while and just, they'll never forget that. And the kids are our future land stewards and it's just so important that they have these experiences. So I'm here, um, I'm available and, um, it's what makes me happy. It fills my bucket. So my physiotherapist was correct. Find something that brings me joy. And uh, it's absolutely done, done it for me. Thank you so much for letting me share all about them. They're so fascinating. Uh, we had one last question that just popped up from Charles. If you had any comment or info on purple milkweed. I don't know anything about it. Um, I'll research it though. Um, I have some friends, one of them who um, is working very actively at um, growing all kinds of different um, species of milkweed. And I will ask him tomorrow, actually. No, I'm going to see him on Wednesday morning. So I will ask him and I will happily get back to you. Milkweed is beautiful. It smells delicious. The flowers, I'm telling you, you know, they cut them and make an arrangement with them. They smell so good. Just don't lick them. I had a question. Of course. Uh, you mentioned raising them outside rather than inside. Yes. Could you elaborate a little bit on that and, and why is it better? So if they're raised inside with unnatural light and temperatures, they don't experience in the third, fourth generation, they don't experience the environmental factors that they need to experience as caterpillars that will make them migrators. So if they're raised inside, it's much more likely that they'll be perfectly healthy butterflies, but they will go outside and not migrate because they will be fully mature butterflies that will want to mate and lay eggs and live six to eight weeks or freeze first. So interestingly, I have to share one more little tidbit. There was a garden fair at the St. Paul's Presbyterian Church in Winchester on September 11th. And I had one caterpillar left and I had a whole bunch of chrysalids that were, the butterflies were about to come out. So I was asked to bring a presentation that day so that people could come and learn about monarchs. And I handed out packets of milkweed with all of the cautions and encouraged people to grow milkweed. And um, the butterflies closed and people, I had different people visiting the garden fair they, they were able to release the butterflies, but I had this one lone caterpillar. And I have no idea why it was such a straggler, but it was the only one left. And then we hit that really cold week and it didn't pupate. It like stayed in this caterpillar stage forever. And then we hit some warm weather again. So sure enough, it crawled up, it found its spot and it spun its silk button and it pupated and it formed a beautiful chrysalis, small, but beautiful. And then we had some more cold weather. And normally, like normally a caterpillar is a caterpillar for two weeks tops. And a chrysalis, maximum 12, maybe up to 14 days, that's all. So this guy formed the chrysalis. The, the fair was on the 11th of September. It formed the chrysalis, I wanna say about a week and a half later. So maybe the 20th of September. And it was in the chrysalis up until um, two days ago when it emerged. And it was this perfectly beautiful little healthy female butterfly. 
the one thing about insects, if you put them in the fridge, it completely slows their metabolism down. And if you ever hear about weddings and funerals and stuff that release butterflies, they are shipped to them in refrigerated containers because that's how they can do it. They, they lower their body temperatures to a point where they're almost in like a high, like complete hibernation mode. Don't ever, please don't ever do that. I don't endorse it. Um, but that's essentially what happened to my caterpillar, both in the caterpillar stage and in the chrysalis stage, that the cold weather slowed down its progress so that it took it literally a month and a half to get to the point where it emerged from the chrysalis and flew away, but it was perfect. So it's really something else I learned. Yes, I have sir. another question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember when we went to your place, uh, you mentioned that the... Um, the migrators, so the last generation of butterflies that will that leave here, that their wings were actually bigger. Yeah. So, pe there, I mean, people all around the globe will say they're they're different. They're not different, and people argue about stuff all the time in the monarch world about what the science actually states. I can only speak from my experience. In my experience, the migrators. I wouldn't say their wings are larger, but they're wider. They have a much wider wingspan and a much shallower wingspan. So instead of being like big rounded wings that really like cover the body, the wings are much more aerodynamic. They, they extend farther and they're not as deep. So they're much more efficient for flying. And because, in my experience, the wings are so much larger. I see them for so much, um, they extend so far to me. I mean, I have a photograph of the difference between a monarch for me in July and a monarch in September. And it, they're like night and day. I've talked a lot. That seems to be all the questions now. Thank you very much, Christina. Well, thank you so think much. Everybody enjoyed that very much. Very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Now we see that, uh, I can see that not everybody voted. And uh, oh. do you want to have a few more minutes to vote on your sunflowers? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. I can help. All right. Um, while you're doing that, I could also let you know who won the first three categories. So okay, the tallest sunflower, that was Gloria Bickert. She had the tallest one at 112 inches. So that's like over nine feet tall. Wow, good for her. Congrats, Gloria. Uh, second one was the largest flower the like the flower head and that was Louise Uhl with uh, 18 inches <laughs> yes giant flower and then the most flowers on one plant was Louise again 41 uh -huh. so the most <laughs> wow. by far that was incredible <laughs> I'm curious was your sunflower competition only for the Russell division uh, or horticultural society? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Members of the society. Yes. Uh, okay. No, I, I, I grew a huge one, but um, I'm in Vankley Kill. So mine was 11 and a half feet tall. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'll try again next year. I have some pictures, actually. Oh, and take out a membership then, and you can... <laughs> Uh, you can compete in our contest. <laughs> I'm already a member of three, so I don't know. <laughs> but thank you for the offer. <laughs> you bet. Christina, you said several times you were amazed by some of the things you learned about the butterflies. Thanks for sharing that. I am, have some new amazement for those butterflies, too. Thank you. You're welcome. I am amazed. My pleasure. Oh my gosh, like watching them do everything by instinct 
and being able to watch them so closely. I mean, my husband laughs and says, you know, did you never have a playhouse when you were a child? Because you're always in that habitat. And I said, well, actually, I didn't have a playhouse, but so yes, like that's why I'm always out there, but there's always something to be watching. And it's interesting because I joined an amazing Facebook group called Ontario Butterflies, Dragonflies, and Moths. I included that group in the list of um, Facebook groups that I really enjoy. I'll warn you, it's very closely curated, which means that if you post something that doesn't follow the right format, you will get a warning. And um, mostly because it's a group that is dominated by scientists and they are interested in the scientific information. So if you don't know what something is, you can post a picture of it and ask, um, but you always have to include the, your location and the date. Um, but I posted the videos of the caterpillar forming the silk button. And then I also posted the one of the caterpillar locating the button with its back end and then molding it to the shape that until it was satisfied that it could attach itself properly. And I had scientists going on saying like, we have never seen that before. And we have not witnessed that. And so here I'm contributing, right? Like citizen scientists, we can all play a role and do a part. And uh, so, I mean, and again, <clears throat> having the technology to do it, um, I was using my iPhone and a, and a tripod to film them, but it wasn't ideal because you have, uh, yeah, and a macro lens on my iPhone to get really, really close to take some of the videos. And a very good friend of mine contacted me and said, yeah, I feel kind of sorry for you, you know, trying to manipulate your tripod in this, in the habitat and like you've got it stacked up on things. So he said, my uh, stepfather left me all of his camera equipment and in there I have this amazing Canon camera and he says it takes two batteries, but it does video as well as still shots. And all you've got to do is get a good tripod and a second battery and you can videotape like for eight hours at a time. So I have set myself up now to be able to, you know, I bought the tripod, I got the second battery and I'm all ready to go for next year to hopefully get some really amazing footage. All right, is there anybody else who's wants to get their vote in before we close it and see who the winners are. If you're struggling to get your vote in, put up your hand and let me know so I can wait for you. In the meantime, I can add one more fact. Caterpillars have yes. six sets, six pairs of eyes. I should have added that before, but literally they have six eyes and you think that they would then have good eyesight, but they don't. They can only discern dark and light and things coming at them, which is why they, they scare so easily. Great, okay, I'm gonna end the poll. We'll see, I'll share the results and we'll see who the winners are. Can everyone see? So for the sunflower visited by the pollinators, Got to get my list here. I've got number nine, I think that is Grace. So that's Grace's photo. Mm -hmm. And then for the group of sunflowers, that's Peggy. Peggy Holt, she's one for that one. Uh, sunflower, any other color? That's Aaron Holt. Yes. Yeah, and then an arrangement that is Louise Ool again, big winner. Uh, painting, uh, craft, garden art made with a sunflower theme. That is Louise. And a poem about sunflowers. That's Gloria. 
Gloria Bickert. Yeah. And the, oh, we have a tie. <laughs> I thought we were going to get away without having a tie. We have a tie for the acrostic. And that is um, Louise and Gloria are tied for that one. And we give a prize to both of them, right? I think that's what was decided, Peggy, yes. maybe. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Good. Do you want to close this out, Grace? Unless somebody else wants and to from, say something. And from the um, flower committee, I'd like to thank everyone for participating. And this was a first for us. And I really appreciate Jacqueline going over and beyond and getting the voting uh, organized. And, um, and so maybe, uh, hopefully, we can do our um, flower competition in person soon, like next spring. Um, but if not, at least we have a way of still having people participate uh, virtually with, uh, with sending pictures. So this is, it's a great way of doing it without, uh, if we can't uh, actually meet in person. But we're all keeping our fingers crossed that uh, we'll be able to do that. So thanks from the Flower Committee. <laughs> I think that's the close of our meeting. It's uh, always so nice to see a lot of the familiar faces. Um, next best thing to being there. And we hope to get the word out for our uh, AGM in November and um, see a lot of you there. Can I just add something quickly? You bet. For, for the AGM, we are going to be doing a craft which involves um, uh, Christmassy stuff so uh, and greens. So if you are uh, a type of person where you're selecting a specific color for your decorations this year and you want to add that to your craft, then you might want to bring a few of your baubles or whatever to to put on to your uh the craft that you'll be making and i don't want to tell you exactly what it is but just in case somebody wants to bring something to um to add to their craft you can you can do that louise is a super decorator extraordinaire <laughs> and she would have a color scheme you can count on it <laughs> this year it's orange and oh. red <laughs> Appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Great. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone in November. You bet. Agreed. All right. Thanks, thank you. Everyone. Bye. 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 Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you. <laughs>